Right, I'm stood on the south side of the day, just between Capeth and Murthley. This is the Murthley side. And until about 400 years ago, this was known as the West Stormont. Uh, as the Stormont came to be known as over that side of the river, uh, which originally was the East Stormont. And at least in popular usage, it was the tract of land that stretched from Dunfell to the west to the junction with the Iowa to the east. And it stretched north right through the Lunan Valley into the foothills of the Grampians above Forness and Mutterston and into the Lorntay Valley and all around there. And I've called the book The Heart of the Stormont. And I've called it that because a series of Elven lairds and other lairds on that side were very progressive and they encouraged their tenants to improve agriculture, they encouraged a fair measure of industry and that essentially is what my book is about. We're now looking at the bridge. The bridge was only built in the 1990s but it replaced an earlier bridge which dates from 1888. Before that, just in the same part of the river, was a ferry, a chain ferry, which had been around since the 1830s. It replaced an even earlier chain ferry from the 1820s. And before that, there was a succession of ferries of different sizes, all lying across this part of the Tay. And that is the route that most people would travel, coming from the south into the Stormont. Of course, there were other ferries further up at Dunkeld, at Portamurthley, Kinclaven, and so forth. But for our part of the Stormont, the part that I covered in the book, it was here at what was known as the Boat of Capeth that locals and visitors came in. The cottage you're looking at was the ferryman's cottage. The last ferryman was James Ballantyne. One of his daughters, Heine Ballantyne, was famous catching just downstream from the bridge the biggest broadcaught salmon in Britain, a massive 64 pound salmon which she caught in 1922 and her record has never been broken. We are approaching Capeth by what was formerly one of the principal entries from the east into the village. In contrast to Spitalfield, Capeth, or Wester Capeth as it used to be called, developed in a quite unplanned manner. In 1759 a colony of weavers was set up at Wester Capeth, living in turf houses at first. These were later replaced by stone houses and there were additions made at frequent intervals. This view, as we approach the back row, gives some indication of the random manner in which cottages might be added, higgledy-piggledy, one against the other. The double-storey four row was rebuilt about 1916 to replace the former rubble-built houses. The Mackenzie of Delvin Mausoleum stands on the site of the original church of Capeth. It is supposedly the east gable and chancel of that church, but if so, it has been much restored and altered. However, within the building there are several marbles commemorating prominent Mackenzies, which date from before the building of the present church in 1798. In these days when coronavirus makes us all conscious of the need to keep our distance and avoid crowds, it's interesting to reflect that similar measures were taken at the start of the 16th century, when plague was rampant. 
In 1500, Bishop Brown of Dunkeld understood this and that when people from far-flung corners of the large and scattered parish of Little Dunkeld assembled at funerals caused by the plague, they increased the likelihood of catching and spreading the disease. In order to reduce the risk, he reduced the bounds of the parish and established a new parish at Capeth. In 1798 a new church was built overlooking the village. It was originally a rather plain barn-like structure, but it underwent various transformations. The spire was added in 1865, but the main transformation took place in the period from 1912 to 1914, when it was converted to the appearance it has today. The remodelled interior is particularly attractive. Within the church are a few relics from the former church including the old poor's box and some communion pewter. An easily missed feature outside is this sundial from the old church affixed to the wall of the steeple. The lich gate was a gift from Sir Alexander Lyle of Glendelvin and it was constructed in 1928. This is Capeth Hall. It was built in 1909 by Alexander Lyle of Glendelvin to a design by the architect Ebenezer Simpson, who had also been responsible for enlarging Glendelvin House. The hall was considered one of the finest village halls in Perthshire and was a great favourite with touring theatrical companies on account of its roomy, well-appointed stage. The weather vane takes the form of a galleon, acknowledging the fact that Alexander Lyle was chairman of the Lyle Shipping Company. This unprepossessing addition is rather interesting. It was built, complete with a steel back lining, to give a little additional length for a firing range established within the hall for use by the volunteers, which was the First World War's version of the Home Guard. By the 1950s, the only shop in Capeth was the one at the top of the Kirk Bray. It was also the Capeth Post Office. Both had closed by the 1970s. In the mid-19th century, the district had, I think, nine pubs, or seven pubs, uh, between Dunkeld and McClure. Um, McClure lasted, there was plenty in Dunkeld lasted, but the only other one in uh, in this parish, the roundabout Spitalfield or Capeth that lasted, was the Ale House. But they voted in 1920 to go dry, and the Ale House um, was converted to housing. We've got a picture here of the ale house as it, when it was still functioning and a couple of pictures of it as it used to be after it was converted to housing. It was whitewashed, now it isn't, it's uh, various houses. But it's slightly obscured now by the hedge, so better view before the hedge grew up here. The principal estate in the uh, Spitalfield area is now Glendelvin. Until the early 19th century, it was known as Ruffle. Since then, it's mainly been called Glendelvin. It was purchased in 1905 by Alexander Park Lyle, the man responsible for building the hall, and... Um, he had made his money from shipping. He was a member of the Lyle sugar refining family, but his particular side of the family was Lyle shipping. He extended Glendelton House to much as it appears today. Here was the former stables, which became the garages, and uh, houses for some of the estate staff.
the former name for Glendelvin Estate was Ruffle. The name has been retained in Ruffle Cottage, which was in fact the farmhouse for the mains of Ruffle, that is the main farm for Ruffle Estate. And although Ruffle became Glendelvin in the 1830s, the name was retained for the house. Also part of Glendelvin Estate was Cult Hill Farm and Implement Works. The Implement Works had a long and important history. The first mention we find of uh, work being carried out there, the Cult Hill was divided into East Cult Hill and West Cult Hill. On East Cult Hill was the, the main farm and there was a smiddy worked by one Douglas Allen. Across the road was a sawmill and carpenter's firm worked by a family called Harrier. Douglas Allen became very well known as a maker of ploughs and his ploughs were in great demand. Some of them were exported to the British Empire, that then was, to Canada, to the continent, to Cult Hill. This little works on the banks of the millhole barn became quite famous across the world. When he died, he was succeeded by his son, John Douglas Allen, known as John Allen. And he had a supporter in Alexander Muir Mackenzie, who had acquired the estate for a short time, and he built some state-of-the-art works for John Allen. And there he made implements such as famously potato diggers. He had a huge business exporting diggers. But he also made a whole range of agricultural implements, including a patent dung spreader, a thistle cutter, various kinds of ploughs, cultivating implements, back delivery reapers. He also eventually acquired the joinery firm of Harriers, and uh, that led him into a big timber business and the manufacture of farm carts. After he died in 1912, his son, also John Allen, continued the business until he retired in 1940, at the beginning of the Second World War. Unfortunately, a month after he retired, he died. The business was carried on by his foreman, Cartwright, a man called Dougal Bryan, and Dougal kept the works going till he retired in the 1950s. We go down the kiln, Bray, which is the kiln, down to Mill Hole, where there was a different kind of industry. The milling of oatmeal. There was the milling of oats to make oatmeal. Quite a large mill. It was driven by a water wheel right up until 1963. Mm -hmm. Just as an aside, there was two members of my own family who served their apprenticeship as millers in the mill and it was widely used by people all across the country. The Miller's House, unfortunately, is now no more, but much of the farm steading is in existence, and the mill itself, as you see, is in fairly good condition on the outside. Um, the door at the left-hand side there was the door into the kiln, which gives the kiln bray its name, and they dried the oats before milling up above. That's what the kiln was for. The adjoining building, there was a thrashing mill in there for thrashing corn. It was also originally driven by the mill wheel, but after 1953, everything was electrified. As we see, part of the setting retains three cart sheds. The stables were next door. Okay, I wanted to just mention this um, nondescript looking wee uh, rise track up through the trees. At one time this was quite important 
This was the West Bay of Red Go. Red Go was the village of more probably Farmington and Cotton that um, existed before Spitalfield was built in 1766. And the most of the inhabitants, the original inhabitants of Spitalfield, came from Red Row up, up on the plateau there. Unfortunately, there's not much point going up because the, it's completely um, encircled with trees, so you can't see any views to speak of, and it's, itself is planted out in uh, uh, conifers just now. But this, as I say, was the old road where everything came and went before Spitalfield was built. Ayrshire was a county known for tree nurseries. These nurseries had a, an insatiable appetite for seed, largely conifer seed, not exclusively. And it became a minor industry in Spitalfield from mid-19th century through to about the 1870s, when there were seven people whose occupation was seed gatherer. They gathered pine fir seeds, and the seeds were other trees, acorns, and so on, but the pine cones were dried in the kiln to release their seed. It seems likely that that's how Kiln Row got its name and that just contracted by local usage to the Kale Row. The village green is probably the most familiar part of the village to most people. It's quite common for motorists to uh, draw off the road, stop and have a picnic on the green if they're not using the um, cafe across the road. The Muckle House, which is all Scots know simply means the big house, <laughs> is the most distinctive building visible from the green. It dominates, in a way, the green and, uh, to some extent, the village. It was built in... 1767, although the first dwellers didn't move in for a couple of years, 1769. It wasn't the first part of the village built. The original village, excluding the Muckle House, comprised of 16 houses, single-storey cottages, four on each side of the space that was left for the Muckle House, and four along the wings, now known as the East Green and the West Green. Most of the inhabitants were weavers from the old settlement of Red Goal up on the plateau behind the village. It used sometimes to be claimed that the Mucklehoos was originally an industrial building, linen mill, etc. It wasn't. It was a tenement, although some of its occupants undoubtedly worked their looms. But then they did the same thing in the wee houses round about it. It was in the 1790s before the houses on the West Green acquired a second story. And uh, this was the idea of Alexander Muir Mackenzie, the first Mackenzie baronet. Another part often overlooked is the main road towards Delvin McClure. The hall is the big building on the right hand side. On the left hand side as you go towards McClure are several houses with quite interesting histories. Where the garage now stands was actually three businesses. There was the horse hiring business connected with what used to be an inn or a public house at any rate, known at one time as the Delvin Arms. And that's the house at the end of the East Road, across the road from the hall. Going further along, there was the Smithy, or Smithy, where the blacksmith worked, and next door to that was the joiner's shop. Then there's a bungalow, which was the joiner's house. It replaced an earlier two-storey house, again occupied by the joiner's. House after that was at one time McLennan's, the bus company's main office. An earlier stage it was the village police station and before that it was a girls' sewing school. Little further along, attractive 
single storey house was the doctor's house. The final thing I want to talk about are the village schools. I mentioned the sewing school, but it wasn't, of course, the main school. The main school was the White House, known as Beechwood. And it was built in 1798, at the same time as the church, and it replaced the former parish school, which was at Ruffle, or Glendelvin. Now, the building served as both the schoolmaster's house, with his family, and also the schoolroom on the ground floor. By the mid-1800s, the, there was disquiet about the inadequate condition of the schoolroom. Eventually, after a lot of procrastination, the landowners who were responsible for maintaining the school decided that a new school was required, and the Red Sandstone School next door to the White House was built in 1857. It continued as the main school up until 1875, at which time what was known as the Wee School was built next door. These schools, along with the school at Capeth, closed in 1927. In fact, the Capeth School closed a couple of years before that, and the Capeth children attended Spitalfield School. But in 1927, the new school, to accommodate pupils from Capeth and from Spitalfield and the surrounding areas, was built at Glendelvin. And that's still the main primary school for children in the district. 